Yes, recording is on. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> the, the talk tonight is loosely entitled Grief and Fierce Compassion. And uh, I was at one point planning to share some reflections on our recent journey to Bhutan and Thailand, <clears throat> uh, but awakening this morning to the news of the election results has, has uh, I just can't bypass what's, what's up um, in this heart, body, mind. And so I, I just need to share from that place and hope that that's okay for um for also what your heart needs. <clears throat> hmm. I'm trying to recall. Oh yeah, it was here in in the Frank Ostaseski's book, The Five Invitations, um, discovering what death can teach us about living fully. <clears throat> where <laughs> I still have some residual cough, apologies. Um, he was speaking about grief. Maybe I can find it easily. And oh, look at me, I found it. And uh, oh, it's actually he's citing C.S. Lewis. Uh, after the death of his wife, wrote that no one told me grief felt so much like fear. No one told me grief felt so much like fear. Whoa. Oh. That, I hadn't heard it that way before, that connection, and it just really lands for me in general, but it also today um, where there's a lot of grief up and um, and with it is so it feels so much like fear there's a there is a lot of fear uh, for for us for humanity for the world for the earth um, yeah so that that was interesting to me how fear and grief are Maybe inter 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 are inter being, and in a, this time in times when there may be for some of us uh, uh, an easy tendency towards othering, uh, feeling like us and them, and or you know some people or those people or that kind of uh, separation mm, might be alive or triggered. And um, to bring some awareness and caution and care to, to that if it's up, this sense of othering and separation uh, Thich Nhat Han teaches and taught uh, about this so well in his poem, Call Me By My True Names, which I've shared before. I, I don't have it uh, ready right now, but that's a profound poem. If you want to understand a little more, reflect a bit more, uh, look that one up, Call Me By My True Names, where he... <clears throat> you know, like one of the most compassionate beings in our lifetime. And so wise and gentle and careful, full of care. <clears throat> and he names in this poem how, mm, talking about being a, a refugee from Vietnam and the, 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 refugee boats and uh, 
the different beings that are were on that raft at that time, the pirate and the girl and the um I think the the yeah, you'd have to read it, but uh, <clears throat> he identifies that these are, I'm also this, I could be this. If I was raised there in those conditions, that's a condition to rising that I could also be living that life. And it, it's, it's a really profound teaching to remind us uh, it's not as simple as we might like it to be sometimes uh, of us and them and and this kind of othering to recognize our interconnectedness, which of course is one of the three characteristics of all things. And how hmm, these two wings of the Dharma, uh, it's often referred to as two wings, like a bird with two wings, wisdom and compassion, and how our dharma and our meditation practice needs to have these two wings balanced as much as possible or in the process of balancing in order to be in that state of uplifting and and clarity. And how having compassion without wisdom is imbalanced. That um, if we don't have the wisdom with compassion, it can just become hmm, it can become like mushy and sentimental. Uh, it can become the near enemy of compassion, which is pity and it, um, contraction of the heart. Mm. It needs to be balanced with the wisdom of understanding our interconnectedness, the wisdom of deeply knowing uh, impermanence, and understanding suffering and the ending of suffering. And likewise, the wing of wisdom, if it's not balanced with compassion, can just be very cold and heady, indifferent, uh, cerebral, <laughs> wordy, uh, yeah, heady. And, uh, needs to be balanced with heartfulness and how we respond to suffering in the world. So the compassion, as I just briefly mentioned there, all the Brahma Viharas have it, what's called a near enemy and a far enemy. So Compassion is one of the Brahma Vihara practices of the, the heart abodes, the awakening of the heart, the cultivation of heartfulness. And the far enemy is something that's like it, it's opposite. It's like the other side of the coin. It's or the other end of the continuum. So compassion's far enemy is cruelty. The opposite of care and compassion is cruelty. Uh, and that's pretty easy to, to see. What's sometimes harder to see is the near enemy, which is something that really seems like it can be construed. We can confuse it sometimes with that quality of karuna or compassion. Um, and we need to be aware of this and look closely. The near enemy that seems like it of compassion is pity. So when we 
feel, it's very important to feel this in your body. Uh, when you feel collapsing of the heart, like, oh, that's so awful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm glad that's not happening to me. Um, that kind of separation you can feel it in your body, you know, if you even just let yourself in, in this moment or any moment bring up feelings of pity and feel the sensations of it in your body, it contracts the heart. The, like physically, you might feel that you collapse and your heart, your shoulders round, your head goes down. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You often see this gesture, or even if you say those words to yourself, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you see how it just collapses and it creates a self that's separate from others? Like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's so awful. And oh, my video just went all fuzzy. Um, I'll just do a quick reset and I'm still here. I do this and it comes back. Okay. So to feel in the body, the difference between that near enemy that creates separation and creates a self that is separate compared to the sensation of Karuna, which is boundless compassion. It's not me fixing or taking care of or doing it's not this me individual separate self that can burn out so easily when we do it from that place but opening and connecting to the true quality of karuna and all the brahma viharas which is boundlessly spacious awake awareness that we can tap into that moves through, acts through this heart, body, mind, through speech and action, thoughts. And when you might be able to feel that difference, <clears throat> this creates a feeling of interconnectedness and openness, respondability. When we tap into this kind of compassion. <clears throat> and so today I really let myself just lean into grief and let this being contract and lie on the couch and be outside and, you know, just taking care of myself as much as I was able and and receiving lots of caring messages from community and offering them of course uh, so there is this self there is the teaching of anatta is um, a, of not self understands that there is this this self, this character, this personality, this confluence of characteristics, this heart, body, mind. And it sees it for what it is, not separate, not permanent, and not a reliable source of freedom and freedom from suffering. So it's not that we just deny this this aching heart, this self, um, we take care uh, so that we can continue to respond and act and um, get at the business of taking care of the world again. Uh, it just reminds me of uh, Frank Ostaseski again, um, in his work at Zen Hospice and accompanying, I don't know, I'm sure thousands of people in their dying time. <clears throat> and 
he says here, at the height of my hospice work, which is what we're doing right now, hospice work, uh, many people died in the course of a week, and at times the grief was overwhelming. I did three things. I made a point of getting regular body work, often spending the better part of a session crying on the massage table. I regularly returned to my meditation cushion and the practices that stabilized my attention, regulated my emotional states, and cultivated pro-social qualities like loving kindness. And thirdly, I would visit my nurse friends who worked in the unit at the general hospital caring for babies who have been born to addicted mothers. I'd sit in a rocking chair, hold these babies and rock them to sleep. There was something about the innocence of the babies and the satisfaction of being able to soothe them that enabled me to reconnect with my compassion and meet the daily, daily suffering that was part of the hospice experience. <clears throat> you know, so he's speaking about how he practices self-care um, in order to continue. <clears throat> um, and and really too, it stands out for me. It's clear to me that underneath our despair is care. The reason there's grief or despair is because we care so much. Is because the compassion is already there, and so it's helpful to then turn towards the compassion and really cultivate that and uh, help that flourish and move move through in this spacious, expansive way, be be buoyed by it, um, turn towards this without bypassing the grief or the despair or whatever else is up for you. <clears throat> and a reminder that a really important, <laughs> that's an understatement, that, uh, Mm, profound foundation of the Dharma is our precepts, our values, our ethics, whatever your core values of how you want to be in the world. And to, uh, if you don't already, maybe take on a period of a few weeks to um, practice with them daily. Uh, write them down, print some print some version off, find your own version of the five precepts that lay people um, practicing and studying the Dharma uh, undertake. Because <laughs> we need a daily reminder mm, in ourselves, in our in the ground, like when you wake up. I undertake the training to refrain from causing harm. I undertake the training to refrain from speaking falsely and harshly. I undertake the training to refrain from taking what isn't freely given. I undertake the training to refrain from causing harm with my sexuality and sensuality, sense doors. And I undertake the training to refrain from heedlessness caused by intoxication. These are the five precepts. And, you know, if these don't resonate for you, what is your, pre what, figure out what your values are, write them down get them in the bones <laughs> and it, it will help sustain us through these times. Um, um, okay, so I want to share one of these. I, how do I decide which one? Uh, 
Oh, so good. I've put both the links to these poems down below and they're here in the Zoom chat as well. Uh, this one I'll read as we start the meditation practice. And so I'll just read this one now from Rosemary Wittola Tromer. Uh, she shared this one on Monday, November 4th, two days ago. Ring the bells that still can ring. We, and she acknowledges this line from Leonard Cohen. Uh, so good. They might cry, just a disclaimer there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Hmm. Batter me, love, like a bell, till I ring and ring and ring, because everything I am, my whole being, is vibrating with the urgent, pressing call for love. Not the sweet love of lullabies, but insistent love that rings through walls, love that drowns out any voice that is not in service of the whole. Batter me, love, until there is no one, including me, who cannot hear the pounding imperative to be kind, to find compassion, until all beings feel real love peeling through their bodies a resonant command so true it cannot be unheard. I have heard other love-battered bells of humans. And the song of them is charging me, changing me, making me long to be rung only by love. It's not easy to keep asking for batter, for the battering, but worse to be silent, worse not to be bell, worse not to be an instrument of love. Once I feared the battering, now I fear it and thrill in the, in the ringing. Love, the only song I want to sing. So tonight, we, I really want to uh, share, offer, be with you in a practice of karuna, compassion, <clears throat> this Brahma Vihara of touching in, being with how it is, with tender, tender care, <laughs> and touch. Uh, hopefully touching into some of this spacious, boundless compassion that is aware of um, all the beings that are in grave danger at this time. Um. Yeah. So that's uh let's let's get ready to practice now. Adjust your space uh and uh anything you need, I'm gonna have some water. Mm -hmm. So mm, some folks are, yeah, you might not feel resonant with this invitation, but maybe you might check it out or lean into it and see if it's helpful 
um, to perhaps see if it's helpful to add some touch, like a hand at the heart or a hand at the belly. Perhaps the, just the hands kind of holding each other, feeling your hands touching, the sensation of touch, of just feeling your legs and feet with the ground, with earth. You might need some movement or touch to any areas that feel tense in the body. Another helpful one when practicing with compassion or self-compassion is to kind of hold your face. <clears throat> so that you take care of your heart, body, mind as you come into your practice. Sighing breaths might be helpful. Just noticing how the effects of these, these days, this day, these times, absolutely have an effect on, on our bodies, hearts and minds. And bringing some caring attention to that. <clears throat> and for for this practice tonight of cultivating touching into compassion and care You might begin by bringing into awareness some being that it's easy to feel heart connected with. It's, it could be an animal companion. It could be someone who's passed. It could be someone who's dear or close to you. Uh, where it's <clears throat> easy to connect to caring attention with this one. So just let this dear one come into awareness in a felt sense or an image or just an awareness. And take some time to really just feel how this is in the body. There might be an opening of the heart or a lightness in the face as you bring them into attention. Letting this one stand in for all those that are dear to us. Understanding that They, like us, are a human being with a body, heart, and mind, just like, just like me. And this dear one also worries and gets frightened. and maybe experiencing suffering, just like me. And this dear one, who at times is experiencing great suffering or less suffering, is trying their best to navigate life, just like me.
Just feel your awareness and your heart in connection. And then allowing benevolent well wishes, wishes for their well being to arise. This might be in your own words, it might be just a felt experience. It might be a sensation of warmth or expansion fullness in the heart center. And you can just let that grow and expand or spread as you let well-wishing arise for them. And then either repeating these phrases or just letting them uh, be in the background. May you have the strength and support to face the difficulties in this life. May you be free from suffering and its causes. May you be peaceful and, and really know happiness. May you be loved. And with this felt cultivation expand through your being in connection with a dear one that also experiences suffering or dukkha. And then perhaps taking a few deeper breaths and reconnecting with the support of the earth, with the felt experience in your own heart, body, mind in this present moment. Again, if it's helpful, you could add a touch to feel your hands or the feet or your heart. Feel what is stirring, the quivering of the heart, as the Buddha called it. And then this night, next part might be overwhelming uh, if it is Please take care and you can open your eyes, feel the ground, take some deeper breaths, some movement, 
just um, touch into the practice and titrating, touch and go if it feels too intense. So now we, <coughs> as you, <coughs> as you choose, could invite in this spacious awareness, feel the literal space that is behind your body and to either side and in front of you above and below. And you can let that space be as large as you're able to connect with. Understanding that consciousness, awake awareness, is boundless and is already of the nature of being compassionate. And let this sensation, particularly the space behind your heart, awake awareness moving through the back of the heart. Through the front of the body. So that boundless awake awareness moves through this heart, body, mind, connecting to Indra's net, the invisible, boundless interconnectedness of all beings. And in this web, at this point, we'll give particular attention to those who are most vulnerable right now. Our LGBTQIA <clears throat> to community. Particularly trans kids and adults. Let awareness spread in all directions. Awareness of the the vulnerability and the, the danger that is a is sparked and awakened for black people, indigenous people, people of color. And as much as you're able, let heart-mind awareness move through you and touching into awareness of so-called immigrants and undocumented, unseen folks. Those unhoused and living in poverty. Women. and the environment, the earth, the water, the air, the icebergs, all the infinite boundless beings. All these beings have a, a body, heart and mind, just like me. They, they have worries and are frightened like me. All these beings are trying their best to navigate life just like me. And 
And tap into this spacious, spacious, vast, boundless awareness that is already of the nature of compassion. And let it flow through you in all directions. May these dear ones have the strength and support to face these difficulties in life. May all these beings be safe and protected. And all these beings be free from suffering and its causes. May all these beings be loved. And if you feel overwhelmed, come back to feeling your body or opening your eyes. And then you could come back to feeling spacious awareness so that our heart doesn't contract with overwhelm. Take a few deeper breaths or some time of reconnecting with body, heart, and the ground, present moment, adding touch if it's helpful, taking care of this self as we do this important radical work of cultivating compassion. And now, if you choose, we could bring into an awareness someone where there is some slight difficulty. Try not to choose the most difficult person. We want to just touch into this so that we can uh, untether the heart. So it could be someone where there's some unresolved, some confusion, some uh, discomfort, just something uh, where there's a bit of tension or confusion, <clears throat> some difficulty. <clears throat> and let this being stand in for all those that we may tend to other in our life or separate from, see as other than ourselves. Touching into the truth that we all have similar needs for water, food, safety, and love. And we all have similar desires for attention, affection, to be seen and to be happy. And 
part parts of us might come up that disagree with how some folks go about finding happiness or safety. And just let those thoughts be known as thoughts and reconnect with spacious awareness that understands our interconnectedness, our similarities. As Thich Nhat Hanh also called himself the pirate on this life raft. This person has a body, heart, and mind, just like me, with worries and fears. They are trying their best to navigate life like me. And so, <laughs> to whatever degree is possible, Allow some well wishes for their well being, for their peace and ease to arise in awareness. If the mind gets too activated, touch into spacious awareness and let that move through, particularly through the back of the body, moving through the heart. May you have the strength and support to face the difficulties in this life. May you be free from suffering and its causes. May you be peaceful and, and know true happiness. May you be loved. And as we continue to practice for a few more minutes, I'll share this poem from Rosemary Witola Tromer called Inviting Spaciousness. Today, when the heart is a small, tight knot, I do not try to untangle it. I don't tug on the strings in a desperate attempt to unravel it. I don't even wonder at how it got so snarled. Instead, I imagine cradling it cupping it with my hands like something precious, something wounded, a bird with a broken wing. I cradle my heart like the frightened thing it is. I imagine all the other frightened hearts and imagine them all being held in love. And I breathe. I breathe and feel how the breathing invites a spaciousness. I breathe and let myself be moved by the breathing as I open and soften, open and soften. And nothing changes, and everything changes. The heart, still a knot, remembers it knows how to love. It knows it is not alone.
May all beings everywhere be safe. And um, <clears throat> that practice was inspired by um, Frank Ostaseski in the Five Invitations. <clears throat> um, thank you, Frank. Yeah, so tender times, please. Take care of yourself and so that we can continue taking care of each other. Um, yeah. Thank you for being here. And uh, next week, I uh, do hope to uh, share some, some teachings from uh, Bhutan. Uh, so... Hope to see you then if you're able. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. I have to figure out how to turn off recording now. Oh, here. <laughs> there was an update and everything's moved. Take care, folks.